This morning, uh, we continue our study through the book of 1 Corinthians. We've made it as, as far as chapter 5. Paul is writing an epistle to a church that was very problematic, to say the least. This is a church that had division. They, they were uh, morally corrupt. There was suing one another. They were getting drunk at the communion table. I mean, this is a church that had issues. And the first things that he does in the first four chapters of this book, he deals what he would call the most important of those issues is that they were divided against one another. It was literally dismembering the body. You know, you, you can't dismember a body and it survive. Right? You just start pulling off an arm here and a leg here and a head here. It's not going to make it. And, and so he took the first four chapters to say, look, in order for the body to be healthy, in order for the body to survive, we can't have um, division amongst us, uh, each other. We can't be, you know, have a schism that's going on within the church. And we have to be of one mind and one heart. We, we, we have one purpose, and that's the kingdom of heaven. And so Paul took, takes four chapters to address that. The second issue that he addresses, we come to in chapter five, and it's the issue of immorality. And it's an immorality that was happening inside of the church. If division is dismembering the church, then sin is the cancer of the church. You see, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't kill it immediately. It just slowly but surely begins to permeate till eventually it dies. And this is the concern that Paul has for this particular church in Corinth. And I think very much so it needs to be a subject that you and I are aware of. And then you and I understand, you know, how the church is to operate. Really, in chapter 5, he's writing to the leadership of the church. And it's really addressing how they addressed the issue of immorality. And so we're, we're going to learn some pretty incredible lessons this morning and as Paul is addressing this with the church of Corinth. And we're, very, we're living very much in a very Corinthian culture right now. Very, very much, you know, sexual morality was rampant in Corinth. It was part of their worship. It was, it was part of everything that, you know, the, the culture embraced. And so Paul's going to address the issue. Now, one of the things the Corinthians did is they took great pride in their tolerance of sin. And it was, it was you know, I would even call it the religion of tolerance. And we're watching that same kind of mentality take place in our culture. Just, you know, the, the higher calling is, in, in, in our culture's view, is that you just accept everything and anything and say, you know what, I, I you know, I, I, who am I to say anything? You know, just Every, to each his own, whoever wants to do whatever they want to do, it's no big deal, that's on them. And, and yet, Paul's going to address the issue of tolerance inside this church here in Corinth. And I think, I think it's an important lesson. I think it's an, a lesson that you and I really need to take to heart as a church and then as individual Christians, how we handle these issues. Because they're all around us, right? None of us can avoid them. We can't escape them. It's, it's in our own families, it's in our own community, it's, you know, it's even amongst some of our, our friends and some even Christian friends. And so we need to go when, you know, what does the Bible say about these issues? Now, Paul is addressing a very specific issue in chapter 5, and so let's jump right in, let's read the first two verses, and then notice how it begins. It says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such sexual morality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. In the first two verses, we, we're, we find the problem. And the problem in Corinth and, and the particular issue that Paul is dealing with is that there was a man inside of the church that was having a sexual relationship with his stepmom. And Paul's, Paul's appalled. Like, it's, it's, it's reported. I, this is an actual thing going on in the church. 
And you guys, rather than mourning this, you guys are puffed up. The, the whole idea of being puffed up is you're actually proud of it rather than mourning the situation going on. And we can, we, we can make a couple of, of conclusions as a result of what Paul's addressing here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This man that, that he's addressing was part of the church. He called himself a Christian. The woman involved in this relationship does not, because he, he never even addresses her, he just addresses the man. So we assume that she's not a believer. She, she is, uh, you know, totally outside of, of the, the fellowship of, of, of the saints. She's, no, she's not part of the, the body of Christ, but this man claimed to be. And, and when, when Paul addresses the issue, he says, look, understand something. Even the Gentiles know that what, she, what he's doing is wrong. This is so wrong that even the unbelieving world doesn't approve of it. Because think about it, it wasn't just a violation of moral uh, conduct, it was a violation of relationship. Can, can you imagine? Here, here's a son who's taken his dad's wife and now he's having relations with her. I mean, what does that do to the, 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 the son and, and father relationship? Much less all of the family and friends and everyone else that's involved. So even the Gentiles would go, that's wrong. Even the Gentile, unbelieving world that has no moral standard would go, you know what, that, that's, that's sick. And he says, and, and the problem is, is that you guys are proud of it. There's something that, that really strikes me as I read this chapter is that Paul is more offended by the church than he is about the sin that this man is committing. He's more offended that the church was, was embracing this kind of behavior rather than exposing this kind of behavior and declaring that it was wrong. And so he, he, it, as we're going through this, no, notice as Paul's going to, you know, really to say, I, I can't believe you guys of all people are acting this way. Because I understand something. As a Christian, what you're declaring is that you're an ambassador of Jesus Christ. You, you say, hey, I, I believe in God. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I'm a child of God. And the moment you do that, you become an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And, and in other words, you're representing God, his kingdom, his, uh, you know, truth to a world that doesn't know him. And th any ambassador, you know, from, from another country comes into our country and, and you know, you kind of, he's got certain privileges that go with being an ambassador, but he also represents the king or the kingdom that he came from. And so whatever he declares, whatever he approves of, whatever, whatever he embraces, it really is kind of a, 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 kind of a foregone conclusion that that must be what his king approves and that must be how their culture operates. And so for these Christians to go and embrace this, he goes, man, do you, you, what, what you guys are doing is, is that you're misrepresenting everything that God represents, everything that God stands for. And I think that's true for all of us, Christian. You live your life and you're representing God. And even the unbelieving world understands that. If you've professed your faith in front of anybody and then you do something wrong, what's the first thing you hear? and you call yourself a Christian. You ever heard that? You call yourself, I can't even believe. Why? Because they look at you and they have a standard that you're to be, to be living by because they even know that's true. And yet, there's here within this church that there, 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 was, there was a group of people in the church of Corinth, the leadership of this church, who were, they, they were puffed up. And, and, and that idea is that they, they were going, you know, we're such a tolerant church. We're such a loving church. We don't judge anybody. We just embrace everything. And it was actually something that they embraced. And, and, and if we find that in our culture. There, there, there's a lot of liberal churches in our culture that are just embracing every kind of immorality that, that, that's out there. And they say, it's okay. It's okay. It got God, God's love, you know, God, God isn't going to do it. No, wait a second. What does God say about the subject? What does God say? Because if you and I are representing God, then we got to know what does God say? 
I, I can't make those decisions. They're too big decisions. So I got to go, what, what, what does God say on the subject? And then I'm going to stand where God says so that I'm standing on God's side rather than on man's side. And so he, very, very, from the very beginning, says, look, th- what, what's going on? This kind of immorality happening inside of the church. It, the, the Gentiles know that it's wrong, and you guys are embracing it. And rather, you should be mourning. That, that's an interesting word. He says, you're so puffed up, and you have not rather mourned. That, you know, you know that, that word, really, is a word that's used when someone dies? When, when you heard the news of the, what was going on, it should have grieved you. It should have caused you to go, man, that, that, that's, that's bad. And actually made you grieve for the man and, and the, the, the situation that was taking place there in Corinth, in the church of Corinth. So they had an opposite effect. They had, you know, rather rather than mourning it, they they were celebrating it. They they were embracing it. And and so Paul uh, calls that for what it was. Look look at verse three. And and this this is an interesting section of, of, of scripture. And I think a very important one for us. Watch what he says. For I, indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together along with my spirit and with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. Wow. Wow. Guys, this is, an, this is called the corrective letter. And, and I get it. it it's, it's, it's pretty intense. It's pretty heavy. You see, he's going, look, let me, let me tell you what, what, what's going on. I'm not even there. And I've already come to a conclusion of what should take place here. I've already judged the situation. Wait a second. I thought you're not supposed to judge. Doesn't the Bible tell us that we're not to judge anything or anybody? No, no, wait, wait, wait. And I think that's worth clarifying here because Paul just says, I judged them. I I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 7 with me because I I think here's a a, a verse that gets quoted quite often. Matthew chapter 7. Judge not. Verse 1. Matthew 7, 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you'll be judged, and with the measure that you use, it'll be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? Do you not consider the four by 12 in your own eye? (laughs) Because he's got a little tiny speck, and you got this big old log. How can you say to your brother, let me remove the plank in your eye and look. Let, let, me, move the, let me remove the speck in your eye and there the, the plank is in your own eye. You hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs nor cast pearls before swine lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. What's, what, what, what Jesus, what's he saying? What, what Jesus is declaring, look, you, 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 you don't walk around as, as the measuring stick, stick about, you know, in every situation that, that you encounter. He said, you better first make sure that you don't got the big old four by four coming out of your head. Because if you got a four by four coming out of your own head, you're, you're, you know, you got the bigger problem and you're worried about someone else's little problem. He says, first let's deal with you. And then you can help your brother with a little speck that's in his eye. Now, what, what, what's interesting is, is that you, you, you and I are, aren't the final say on anything. God is. And that's, that's, what, that's what the whole idea of not judging. I, I, don't, I can't determine who's going to heaven, who's going to hell, and I can't make that declaration or make that judgment on somebody else's life. But we can see action. And you and I are to be not judges, but we're to be fruit inspectors. 
Big difference. Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. You cannot take fruit out of a thorn tree, right? I mean, he's just saying, you, you can see by someone's actions really where, where they're at. And, and I think it's an important point here, guys. Is, is, you know, th- there's a difference between judging someone's eternal state and someone's motives, which you and I are never supposed to do. I, I, I don't know. And matter of fact, Paul covered that in chapter 4. We just, we just read it a couple weeks ago. Remember what he says in, in verse 3 of chapter 4? We're right there, 1 Corinthians 4, 3. What, but with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you by a human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself for I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified this. Watch this. But he who judges me is the Lord. And he's saying, look, you, you're, you're trying to, you say you know my motives, but you don't know my motives and I don't even know my motives sometimes. I, I, God knows my motives and he's the one who's gonna, gonna judge all of that on that day of judgment. That's, that's, not, that's not my issue or your issue to do. But what he's talking about here is something something entirely different. He's talking about a family. And and the that we're all representing something together. We're present, we're representing the kingdom of heaven. Christian, you and I are representing God and we're, we're representing uh, what he declares and and therefore there comes a responsibility we have not just to God but we have a responsibility to one another. You know, I, 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 ever since my kids were, were growing up, I always, you know, look, you represent me wherever you go. You're a hot meal. And, and what you do out there, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to reflect on what we do in here. It's because you represent us as a family. And I think that's true as the church. Guys, we represent each other as the body of Christ. And so if, if we're embracing something that God says is wrong, then the assumption is to someone out in the world is, is hey, that church must embrace something that's, you know, that, that God says is wrong. Because that, that's, that's how a family works. And when, when Paul is addressing this whole, this whole, this whole subject, he's, he just simply says, look, you, you have a responsibility to deal with this situation in your church. Now, go, go, go back with me. The, to verse four, watch what he says. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together, and that, that means that there, there was the assembling, along with my spirit and with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Whoa. How does that work? He says, someone that, that, that just willfully says, I don't want to do what God says. I, I want to live in this sin. I want to continue to have this relationship with, this, uh, with, with my stepmom. And, and someone's confronted this guy. Someone's already said, hey, man, what you're doing is wrong. And he just says, I don't care. I'm going to keep doing it. And then someone else comes to him and says, hey, you know, two or three have gone to him. Matthew 18 says, when someone sins against you, you're to go to, between you and that person by yourself. And you're to tell him, hey, what you're doing is sin. And if that guy goes, yeah, yeah, okay, and he doesn't repent, then you're going to take two or three with you. And if he don't listen to two or three, he says, you're going to bring it to the church. This is the process that he's talking about. It's been brought to the church now. It's, it was wide open. Everyone knew about this. And so now what, what, what Paul is saying goes, look, what you need to do is you need to hand this guy over to Satan's domain. And, and I, I think, that you're like, what, what's he talking about? The thing about, the, think about this, guys. There, there's, on, there's only two kingdoms. There, there's the heavenly kingdom, God's kingdom, and there's an earthly kingdom, and Satan is the prince of this world. There's, he's the one who's dictating how this world operates, what the, 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 the standards of this world. You see, you're on one side or the other. You're either in God's kingdom or you're in the, you're in, you're in the devil's kingdom. There, there's, there's no middle ground. There's, there's not like a neutral. You're like, well, I'm not in either one. I'm just kind of neutral. No, there's no neutrals. And if you decide, I don't want to be under the lordship of Jesus Christ, I, I don't want to obey the things that God declares to be true, then what you're declaring is, is I'm following Satan. And what Paul is saying is, is you know what, hand that guy over to who he wants to follow. Just say, hey, 
you, you don't want nothing to do with God's kingdom. You don't want to follow what God declares. So you know what? Why don't you just go do what you got to do? And you're not welcome in the, in the body of Christ. Man, that, 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 that's harsh. When you first read that, you go, whoa, man, that, I mean, really? Is that, is that how the church is supposed to handle sin? I understand something, guys. What he's declaring is the immune system for the body. The body has to have an immune system. Because if everything else is, is, is if every disease is allowed to, to, to enter, then it's just going to cause great sickness. And so he's saying, look, there, there's, there's the responsibility you have to hand this guy over to Satan and say, if that's, if, you know, if that's what you choose, then you know what, man, have at it 100%. Go for it. You, you want to live for this world? You want to live for Satan? You, you know what? Let him have you for a little while. And maybe, maybe at the end, you'll come back and go, man, I, 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 that's not where I want to live. That's not how I want to live. Did you notice how he, how he, how he closed that? That his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. Guys, that, that is the purpose for doing what Paul's declaring to do. It's the most loving thing that that church could have done for this man. Is by telling him, look, what you're doing is an offense to God. And the way that you're living your life is, is, is in rebellion to him. Because if you come along and say, oh, you know what, God loves you anyway, and you just kind of embrace it, then he never has to deal with his sin. He never, he never has to acknowledge that what he's doing is wrong. And how cruel would that be? If you know the truth and you're not willing to share that truth because you don't want to offend somebody or you don't want to look a certain way. That's mean. Is that, that you, you, you would allow him to live his life in a, in, a, in a total lie because it's going to cause discomfort in your own life. That, that's not love. I, I would much rather, if someone loved me, to come and say, hey, Ray, you know what? You, I, I noticed you're doing this. I, I, you know, I've heard this about you. Is this true? And then I go, well, yeah, it's true. And go, you know what? That, man, let, let me, let's open the scriptures. What does God say about that? And I were to go, man, I thank you. Thank you. That, that you, you would love me enough, care about me enough to, to tell me what I needed to know because I, 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 I don't want to live in rebellion against God. You, you see, hopefully that's the heart that it's received in. And, so, and this, is, this is the cool thing, guys. In chapter, in, in, in 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, Paul dresses this man again. He says, hey, he's repented from his sin already. Now you need to forgive him and you need to embrace him and bring him back into the fellowship. And so the whole purpose for what he's declaring here was so that this man could be restored back into a relationship with God and therefore a relationship with the body of Christ once again. That was the reason for doing it because he loved him. You see, the most unloving thing you can do is just pretend that everything's fine. The most loving thing you can do is to go and say, hey, bro, I, you know, I, I care enough about you to tell you. And I get it, guys. It, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing for all of us because we have relationships. We have friendships. We got people that we care about. And, you know, to, to go and, and, and to make a stand and say, you know what? You, you guys aren't married. You're, you're, you, you, you guys are going to visit. But you know what? I, I don't approve of you guys sleeping together in my house because I, I, it's not right. And, and I, can't, I can't be a participant in that. And, and, you know, oh, I can't believe you're so judgmental. You're so, no, I, it's, it's, man, I, I, I care about you. And I, I don't, I don't want to be complicit in, in not making a stand for what right is. And it's a hard thing to do. I, I understand it. And yet Paul is asking this church, you know what, you, you guys need to make a stand when it comes to this man. And if he has no desire to repent, now, th th let me clarify something here. And I, I don't want you to walk away from your thinking, well, if someone's in sin and then we need, no, this is someone who is in unrepentant, blatant sin that there's no desire to change. In other words, what he said is, I'm embracing this 
And, and I, I, I don't think it's wrong, or I don't, I, I'm not going to change even if I do know it's wrong. There's a big difference. You see, because, guys, we all struggle against sin, don't we? I'm the only one? We're all struggling against sin. And if, and if, and if the standard is, is that no one sins, then we would have an empty building here. That, that's not what he's declaring. Now, if you're struggling against sin, join the club. <laughs> But if you're going to go and, and full on embrace sin and say, this is what I'm holding on to and I'm not going to let go of, then that's a whole different realm. And this is what he's dealing with here. That this is a man who had embraced, I'm, I'm going to stay in this relationship with my stepmom. Uh, I don't care what the church says. I don't care what Jesus says. I don't care what the Bible says. I, I don't care. And he said, look, if that's going to be the stand that you're going to make, then you're not welcome. And you, 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 you can't be in this covering of the church. You can't be un, under, under the, the, the blessings of the fellowship of the saints and then still think that everything's going to be fine. Man, you, you need to be, be aware that that's not acceptable. And so he says, you're, you're, you're to hand him over to Satan. With the hope that he would repent and be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, let's, let's move forward. Look at verse six. Again, n- notice where he goes back to. Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He says, "Don't, don't you know a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump? If you have a, a lump of dough, and, and that dough has been infected with yeast. And you just take one little speck, you know, just pinch that little bit of yeast, uh, you know, dough, dough that's been infected, you set it to the side, you bake your bread, and then you take that one little piece and you need some new, some new dough, you have a new lump, and you just take that one little speck of yeast and you put it into that new loaf, that new lump, you know what's going to happen? It'll eventually permeate the whole lump. It, it, it'll, it'll just slowly but surely just begin to just work its way through the whole lump and then the whole lump will rise and you'll have a whole new lump that has leaven in it. And what Paul is declaring is that's the same thing that happens with sin. You allow a little bit of sin in, in the church and, and, and you're aware of it and you just kind of wink at it. You just kind of close your eyes to it. You just pretend it's not there. And pretty soon, man, that leaven will begin to infiltrate to others. It, 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 is, it is, you know, you just think, like, it's okay to live in a sexual and moral relationship. It's okay to shack up together. And then, you know, everyone knows that, the, that, you know, everyone's aware of it and no one says anything about it. And then what happens, everyone in the church begins to say, hey, it must be okay. It's not a big deal. And it begins to permeate every aspect of the fellowship. And what happens eventually is that, you know, that, that just becomes the norm. It just becomes, you know, yeast was, was, the whole picture of yeast, once a year at Passover time, the Jews were to take all of the yeast in the house and they were to discard it because it was a type of sin. And they were going to celebrate the Passover, which was the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That, that's what the Passover was all about. And what they would do is they would literally go through every aspect of their house. Anything that had yeast in it, they were to throw it out. You go to the toaster, you know, open up, they get all the crumbs out of the toaster. They, they, they would go through the cabinets, they'd go through every, and they would throw anything with yeast out so that it was cleansed and, and there was no representation of sin in their home. And he uses that Old Testament picture to say, look, you're now a new lump. You're unleavened because of Jesus Christ. But then you will go and you allow that to permeate again, man, and it's, it's gonna have a devastating effect upon you and upon the church. It'll become the norm. It'll, it'll become what's acceptable. 
And, and as, as, as Paul is, is writing this passage, he, he's, he's wanting them to, to understand that, um, you know, what Jesus did on the cross was meant to purge sin, not, 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 to, not to give you a, a license to sin. It was to purge it. It, it, you know, I, and I think, you know, one of the things that you and I are to do is we're, we're, to, we're to be showing a representation that Jesus Christ came into this world. He came into this world to deliver us from sin, not just to forgive us from sin. He came to free you from the bondage that sin has upon your life. And I thank God there was men in my life that showed an example of what that looked like. That, that, you know, I, I went, you know what, they used to be drug addicts and sexually immoral and they, they used to be, you know, all of those things, but they came to Jesus Christ and they're no longer in bondage to those same things anymore. And, and, and I thank God, you know, that I had someone that, that declared that to me and, and, and stood for that in my life. Because there was a time that I was in bondage to drugs. To, I was to living a sexually immoral life. There was a time when, when you know, I, I was just given over to those things. And had someone come along and say, hey, it's okay for you to keep doing that. You're just a Christian and now you can keep, you know, well, well, where would I be today? Thank God. Thank God. That there, there was someone willing to stand up and say, you know what, this is what God declares. This is what's right. And, and I know this, man. I, I, one time I was in bondage to those things, but no longer. Because Jesus freed me from those bondages. I'm, I'm not a drug addict. I'm not a drunkard. I'm not a, a, a deviant that I used to be by the grace of God. And he freed me from those things by, by his grace and 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 what what paul is saying is look guys what you're doing is you're misrepresenting what god has done you need to purge that old leaven out You, you 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 need to have a new lump without leaven. I mean, you know, God's doing a whole new thing in your life. You're, you're not just, you know, somehow, you know, sanctifying the leaven. You're, you're now, now you're saying the leaven needs to be discarded and removed from a life. It needs to be purged. Guys, in this chapter, and I, I think, it's, like I said, I think it, it's, it's monumental. It, it, it deals with, you know, the problem that, that the church faces, especially in the culture that we're in. And I think this chapter is the, the, the immune system for the, for the body of Christ. It, it teaches us how we're to, to keep the cancer from entering in and, and, and destroying the body of Christ. This is to be a sanctuary. We, we hear that term all the time. We're going to the sanctuary. A sanctuary is a safe place. Could you imagine if everyone was still doing everything immoral that we used to do as Christians? It wouldn't even be a safe place. You would have to go to the church and go, man, you know, you know I, I'm being preyed upon or I'm being enticed or I'm being, you know, swayed to do, you know, involved in some other sin. No, we're, we're to be a sanctuary. We're to be a place where, hey, I, I'm going there and I know those people love God. I know they're going to represent God and I know that you know, they're going to be encouraging to do godly things and pursuing righteousness and you know, the things that, that are going to be for edification. And, and so Paul very, very clearly tells them this is how you're to handle this. Now, when we come to verses nine all the way to verse 13, he tells us who this applies to. And I, and I think guys, just, just as important as uh, what, what he declared in verses one through eight, that you know, th- th- this, this is the, the problem and the effects and, and this, this is how we, we confront these things and this is how, how we're to respond to these things. Now he's gonna tell us who this applies to. And, and I think that, that also is very, very important. Look what he says in verse nine. He says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Now, it's, a, it, 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 it's apparent that Paul had written an earlier epistle to the church of Corinth. What we're actually reading is Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And then when you get to 2 Corinthians, it's actually Paul's third letter to the Corinthians. But we don't have record of the first uh, epistle. 
We have a, we have a record of this epistle, the, the, the first epistle to the Corinthians. But he tells us, I had written to you another epistle, and when I wrote that epistle, I did not write that you're not to keep company with sexually immoral, sexually immoral people. Well, what is he talking about? Well, look, look at verse 10. Yet, I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or the extortioner or the idolater. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. And I, I think that that's a very important point that Paul is making. He's not talking about the unbeliever. He's not talking about the Gentile. Christian, understand something, man. He's not asking us to be isolationist. I, I, I can't, someone's sexually immoral, I can't talk to them. I can't fellowship with them. I can't hang out with them. That, that's not what Paul's declaring. Or an extortioner or a drunkard. He's, he's not saying, matter of fact, you and I have been encouraged to be, to be the light of the world. We're to be the salt of the earth. And you can't be the salt of the earth if, if you're never going to go to the earth. You can't be the light of the world if you're going to hide. And so he's, what he's not declaring to us is that now, you know, now that, that you're a Christian, you need to isolate yourself from everybody that's, that's doing anything wrong. Matter of fact, I, I, I think it's quite the opposite. You and I are to go out into the world and we're, we're to show the world what a life that's under the lordship of Jesus Christ looks like. That we're... we're no longer ruled by our vices or by our, our tendencies or by our sin, but that, that we've been freed from those things and that it's possible not to be a drug addict. It's possible not to be a drunkard. It's possible not to be sexually immoral and to live in this world. You're, 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 you're the only epistle some people will ever read. Do you realize that? Amen. You're the only epistle before someone comes to Christ, that anyone is ever going to read. And so you and I need to be living a life that, that's, that's representing the kingdom of heaven. We're the ambassadors of heaven. And because of it, we, we, we should be going, man, I, I, I want to rightly represent my king, Jesus. Jesus, in, in, in one of the passages in Luke chapter 6, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, when you don't do the things that I say? Now that's all, that verse always just haunted me. Why are you calling me your Lord if I'm not really your Lord? Because if he's your Lord, then you're going to take what he says. You're going to go, okay, that's what right is. That's what, that's what truth is. That's how I'm supposed to live my life. But if you don't want to live your life under his lordship, then at least acknowledge he's not my Lord. And so he very, very clearly tells them in this passage, he says, look, I'm not talking about the world. I'm not talking about the unbelieving world. I'm not talking about the Gentiles who don't know God. I'm talking about those who know God. Watch what he says in verse, verse 11. But now, I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or idolater or a rivaler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Wow. Isn't that harsh? No, 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 no. That, that, that's not the intent. The intent is, is that your brother who calls himself a brother would... would have to conclude, man, and I, 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 I'm not even embraced by others who follow Jesus. They don't even want to hang out with me. They don't want, they don't have any fellowship with me and, and, and hopefully bring them to their senses to say, man, I, what I'm doing is, is in violation to what God says. And I don't, I don't want to live in that condition in my life. Did, did, did you pick that up? He says, anyone named a brother. And this person is, in, is, is considering himself to be part of the body of Christ, to be part of the family of God, and to be a brother to, to the, the saints or a sister to the saints. 
And he says, and, and yet they're going to continue to live and embrace this immoral lifestyle. They're going to continue in their drunkenness or rivalries or drunkards and extortioning. He says, you know what? You're not to fellowship with that person. And in that culture, to eat with somebody, that meant you become one with them. Amen. And, and it, was, it was very real in that culture as well. You see, when, when, when you would sit around and have a meal, there would be one loaf of bread. And, and you'd get, kind of tear off a piece of bread, and then you would dip it into the sauce, and then you would eat it, and then you would double dip. Right? <laughs> being one was being one. <laughs> you were swapping germs just to have a meal together. And what he's saying is, look, you're... you're not to have that kind of communion. When you sat down with someone, it meant that you were, you were, you were embracing one another, that you were, you were one with one another. It was, it was approval. It was, it, was, it, was in, it, was, it was an acceptance. And he says, look, if someone's gonna live in this rebellious relationship with God and then they wanna have a normal relationship with you, he goes, really, how does that work? How does that work? It doesn't. And he says, you're, you're not even to eat with, with such a person. Guys, that, that, that's intense. I mean, it, 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 it's heavy. Now, look, look, look what he says in verse 12. For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? Someone that's not a Christian, you, 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 you don't have any right to tell them anything about their sin. You know what? They need a relationship with Jesus. That's what they need. They need to know that, that God loves them and that God's willing to forgive their sins. And if they'll just receive the forgiveness that God's offering them by dying on a cross for them, that, that God will, will embrace them and call them his own. You call, walking around going, oh, you little sinner. I mean, that's not going to do anything. You're going to push them further away from the Lord rather than bring them to the Lord. He's talking about someone who's already made that decision that I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And he's saying, look, you know, we have a responsibility to one another as a family, as the family of God. And, and, and it should be taken very, very seriously. No, guys, you know, this isn't, you know, I heard a rumor and I'm going to go deal with a rumor or this isn't, you know, you're out sniffing sin. You ever, you ever had a sin sniffer? <laughs> Someone that's just looking for sin. You know, I know there's sin here somewhere. I'm going to find it. You know, it just, that's, that's not the heart of it. But if, if someone just openly embracing their sin, sexual morality, drunkenness, you know, rivaling, you know, all of the, this, you know, extortioning. They're just ripping everybody off and they're walking around proud of it. You're like, what's wrong with you? You're representing the king. You're representing the kingdom. And, and we have a responsibility to one another in that avenue. And so it, it, it's, I think it, it's Paul telling the body to be the body and, 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 and then to make sure that, that, you know, we're not allowing infection and disease to, to, to overtake that body. Now, you know, what's interesting is, is that the whole intent is always repentance, always. It's always that I would come to my senses and go, man, what I'm doing. You know, what's interesting, Jesus wrote seven letters to the churches. And in every one of those letters, he wrote, uh, you know, an area that needed to be corrected. There was only two churches, the church of Philadelphia and the church of... Um, Thyatira, I believe. No, it wasn't Thyatira. Go, I mean, t turn to Revelation. Smyrna. There you go. Smyrna was the persecuted church. Those are the only two churches that never got a rebuke. The one that was being persecuted and the one that was de demonstrating the love of Jesus Christ in, 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 in their community. But let, let me just read you a, a couple of uh, passages. L look, at, look at chapter 2. Look at verse 12. This is Jesus talking to one of the churches. Watch, watch what he says. To the angel of the church of Pergamos write. These things says, he who, is, who, who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know your works and where you dwell and where Satan's throne is. You hold fast to my name and do not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr. 
who was killed among you where Satan dwells. For I have a few things against you. No, notice what Jesus says. Because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to stump to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel and to eat things sacrificed to idols, watch this, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold to the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which are things I hate, repent or else I'll come to you quickly and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Guys, this is Jesus writing to this church. He's saying, look, you're going to continue your sexual immorality and all of your idolatry and all these things. He says, you're fighting against me. And I'm going to fight against you. That, that, again, you know, he, what Jesus is looking for is a church that, that, you know, acknowledges their sin, repents of their sin, and then begins to, you know, draw upon the power of the Holy Spirit to live a life that's pleasing to him. No, 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 let me give you one more. Look, look, look at... Look at chapter 3. Look at verse 14. An, another letter. And I, I would encourage you, read, read the letters to the seven churches. Chapter 2 and chapter 3 of the book of Revelation. But look what he says in this letter. To the angel of the church of Laodicea and write. These things says the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I know your works, that you're neither hot nor cold. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich and you become wealthy. You say you have need of nothing and you don't even know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with the eye slave that you may see. As many as I love, look at Jesus, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Over and over. I want to put eye save on your, on your eyes. I, 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 want, I want you to be healed from your blindness. I mean, Jesus, you know, is, is trying to get them to the place where, where they're repented of, 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 you know, the things that they're doing. And then no, notice the next verse, and you, you may know Revelations 3.20. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, check it out, and dine with him and he with me. Dine. Did you, do you remember we just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 5? Don't even eat with such a person. And yet Jesus is saying, the moment that you open up your heart and you let me in, now you and I are in fellowship. Now now everything that the past is washed away and now you and I can have communion together and we can have fellowship together because God is just looking for a person that's willing to repent, to turn from what they're doing so that they can get right with God. Never to condemn, always to fix. And it's always the heart of God. God doesn't want to condemn any of us. God is looking for us to respond to the gospel message. For us to acknowledge that our sin is what separates us from him. And the only way that we can be made right with him is if there's a repentance of that sin so that fellowship can once again take place between us and him. And as, and as Paul was concluding this letter to, the, to the, this chapter to the church of Corinth, he just simply says, look, guys, uh, you know, we're, we're to be judging those from the inside. No, look what he says in verse, 15, verse, uh, verse 13. We'll wrap it up right here. He says, those who are outside, God judges. Those who are outside, God judges. You, you, you have no business worrying about what anyone else is doing. This is between the body of Christ. I, I can't tell how many times someone asks me, well, what about the guy in Africa? God judges. Don't worry about him. The guy who never heard the gospel, that's, that's God's business. Why are you worried about what God's business is? That God's going to judge him, and he's going to judge him justly and fairly and righteously. You know, I, 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 God's going to do a better job of being God than you are. Those who are outside God judges. But then he says, 
Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. If someone doesn't want to repent of their sin, he says, you know what? You can't make it comfortable for them to continue to think that they're okay. And that really is, is, is an important you know, uh, a lesson that the church needs to hear. And it's maybe for us this morning, and I, I'll tell you, I, you go back and you read these, and you go, man, Lord, you know, I, I, if there's areas in my own life that I, I, need, I need to address or, or, you know, deal with God, help me and change me and forgive me. And, you know, it just, it always makes you self-reflect. It always makes you come back and, and really ask the questions, man, where am I at in my walk with the Lord? And it should, it should cause us to do that because it's God's word. It's truth. And then as we, as we conclude this morning, maybe it's even this morning where God is speaking to us and we realize, you know what? I, 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 I've, been, I've been living a double life. I, I've, been, I've been saying I'm a Christian and yet I know I'm in open rebellion to God and he's already told me that. And this morning, man, I, I, I need to ask him to forgive me. I need, I need a change the course that I'm in because I'm not just affecting my relationship with God I'm affecting the rest of the body it's leaven now and I, I, I don't want to be uh, the, the poison in the church I, I want God to forgive me I want God to change me and it could be the, the little thing that God's been trying to deal with you know in your own heart or it could be the big thing that God's been trying to deal with in your heart it doesn't matter it, it, you see God is trying to get us in, in that place where we surrender.